marketing. And I think throughout the course of this session, you're going to meet a lot of different business people who are maybe working on different aspects of marketing and or finance. There's so many things related to new product development, product management, that you know we really touch a lot of different aspects of the company. So I feel very fortunate because I've had a lot of good background and I've worked with a lot of more than one local company. Um, I've been a product manager at Rockline Industries um, and they do consumer goods, Venus manufacturing, primarily toilet seats, although I worked in other areas of their business as well. And I'm currently working for Walrat Company and managing some of their commercial cookware products. So a lot of different aspects, but everything we talk about today is going to tie into market segmentation, customer segmentation. Um, really kind of look at this as there's so many aspects of this course that are really building blocks. And we're in the really early phase yet. Um, as Mr. Stone mentioned, you've been working on your product ideas or service ideas this week. How many of you kind of have those pretty well thought out or feel like you're 80% of the way there? Show of hands, yep. You know what y'all Okay. Um, I did get to see a lot of your profiles, but if we can just very quickly, um, very briefly touch on what it is that you're focusing in on. Uh. I really want to start a business my own, so I kind of want to develop those like skills now and kind of get like an experience with it. Mm -hmm. So, what's the product idea or service idea that you thought about for this class? Uh, one of them I thought of is like a window tint for like vehicles, okay. so like you can like turn it on and off, or like kind of like put it in like the middle, so it's like adjustable. Okay. All right. And we don't have to get into a lot of detail. I'm just looking for some kind of high level. Um, my problem was that people are too busy, so I was thinking of making like a to-do list where you can like click on your to-do list and find people to do it for you. <laughs> Let me know when you get that done. <laughs> How about you? Um, my problem was that a lot of cosmetic students today consume a lot of chemicals, mm -hmm. so I would create a brand that doesn't. Okay. How about you? Um, I'm Corbin, and I think the main point of the meeting is incubators develop business skills and insight needed to make a, a big business. Okay. And I have a lot of ideas right now. I'm going to take the time to narrow it down over the weekend, but a lot of them are based around how to make a proper leadership system to make a big corporation work. And then the overarching, like what they actually sell, it's dependent, of course, and of course it would have like, proper marketing, proper actual usage. But I'm more focused on how to make that kind of business actually work okay. in the long term. All right. Well, hopefully today we'll give you some better ideas on how to fine tune your actual project for this um, semester. It's actually the whole year, right? Yes. Okay. How about you? Um, a bunch of ideas, but nothing really concrete yet. Um, one, I've dissected a few. One of them I dissected was that people just spend too much time on their phone. And they're consuming and not actually thinking creatively and learning about things. So. Okay. How about you? Um, I'm Nick. I've got a couple ideas I definitely want to look at more, but my more developed one is the, um, the unavailability of parts and saw your video. Very interesting. My son is very much into cars and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. How about you? Um, my name is Manuel. Um, saving more time when cleaning like a cosmetic product because they could do so much thing during cleaning.
Well, I'm glad you all have some good ideas. And some of the things we, we talk about today are bigger picture. And um, I'll warn you, sometimes um, in business we have jargon, new words, new concepts that you may not be familiar with. So if at any time you're, you're curious or I use a term that you're not familiar with and you're like, what, what is that? Please, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, that is so typical in business as well. People speak in jargon. It's almost like you have to learn this new language. Also, continue to think about this like building blocks. And you know, we're going to talk about a few different things today. Next week, we get into a little bit more. But all during the course of this, um, you're going to be starting to connect some dots. And by the time you get further into it, you'll start to see how all of this totally ties together into like a business plan and a business proposition. So all exciting stuff. You can tell I love talking about this stuff. Um, today we're going to focus on customer segmentation. Next week we'll talk a little bit more about customer personas. We'll spend day three maybe reviewing a little bit more about your specific customer personas. And we'll also talk about market scalability and size, all of which will tie into future concepts when you get into your forecasting and um, uh, pricing strategies and that type of thing. So uh, again, connecting the dots, but all going forward. All right, so segmentation at the very highest level. Um, if you stop and think about it, everything has segments. So it's not just your customer segments. Starting at the real high level, we talk about industry segments. So all businesses are generally affiliated with other industry segments, and they're doing like things. A good example would be the automotive industry. But when you think about the automotive industry, you can now start to funnel that down. There are market segments within the automotive industry. Um, a good example might be commercial trucks and vans versus big diesel semis versus consumer products. Um, so when you think about your industry segments, think about how your product concept or idea fits in. Like what group would you actually end up being in? Then when you get down to your market segments, again, that's your, your targeted, more focused product line. And then your customer segments are, are kind of further drilling it down. You can kind of think about it as an inverse uh, pyramid. So there are some local companies, a lot of local companies actually. We, we fortunate, uh, fortunately live in an area that has a lot of industry. Um, who can tell me maybe a good example of one or two of the large companies in, in our county? Cool. Okay, and what industry segments do you think Kohler focuses on? Housework. Mm -hmm. Plumbing products is one. Kohler's very interesting because they have another aspect or another industry segment that they're in. Any ideas what that might be? That's another one. Yep, yep. I actually didn't thought of, think about that because it is so small. Where's the elephant in the room? Think about Main Street Kohler. Yeah. What? Toilets. But there's another building right on Main Street in Kohler. It's huge. A lot of people, it's a destination. How many golf courses do they have? Yeah. Hospitality. Yes, yes. And that's, that's an example of how some larger companies are in completely separate industry segments. And, and when you think about their competition, their competition in the hospitality segment is very different from the competition in their plumbing segment. Um, so that's how you can start to think about uh, business and kind of where you fit in and, and how you compete. Um, there's a lot of others in Sheboygan County. We have a lot of food-based companies in Sheboygan County with Sargento and Masters Gallery and, and um, some of those companies. So, um, and consumer products. Rockline is a good example of consumer products and consumables. Um, and Walrath and Bemis. Bemis is an interesting one because they have consumer products, but they also target um, commercial plumbing. 
So again, different market segments within the business, and some companies will operate those independently. So you were, uh, Corbin, you were thinking of you know, business in general, thinking about big business, they might have different business units, different business divisions that they run like little mini companies within a big company, and that's not at all uncharacteristic. Um, John Deere is another example. I used to work years ago with um, John Deere as a company, and they were a good example of having many different business segments within their business. They had lawn and garden, which was focused on consumers um, that needed their riding lawnmowers, but then they also had their big agricultural division. Very different focus, um, very different type of product, so the engineering, the product development, the market research even that goes into those types of things is very different. Any questions about that at all? And I guess as you're continuing to kind of fine tune your idea, you can start thinking about where you fit in, who do you compete with? It's all information that you'll need to be thinking about down the road in future segments. Um, then we're going to talk about customer versus consumer. So uh, customer is actually the person or company who is going to be buying your, your product. Um, the consumer is the person that's actually going to be using it. And sometimes this can be two different people. Can you think of any examples where the person buying the product might be someone who is not necessarily using the product. Yeah? Retail stores. Retail stores, that's a very good example. And I'm surprised you picked up on that one because that's, um, when you think about how you have to pitch your product, you pitch it differently to the buyer of that retail store than you might when you're promoting the actual product in the store. Yeah. So you're, the, purchaser is actually different in some respects versus the consumer. And it is something that you have to think about as you develop a pricing strategy. But thinking down to a product level, can you think of any examples where um, the person buying the product might be different than the person consuming it? Think about food products. Sartori. Sartori, how so? Just the other day, Mr. Stone was talking about how Sartori doesn't make the, the cheese and like whatever, okay. but they package it in a certain way that's convenient for people who need snacks and stuff. Okay, all right, that's, that's a kind of a little bit different aspect of it. I was thinking more along the lines of a product like um, kids' cereal, as an example. If you think about it, the kids aren't actually buying those products. They can certainly influence the buyer, especially if they're riding in the shopping cart with mom and they see the Fruity Pebbles um, right flashing front and center and nice pretty glitzy packaging and the consumer is actually going to be the, the toddler whereas the, the purchaser is the mother. Um, a few years ago I, when I was working for Bemis, we were actually creating some products for elderly people and oftentimes we found through market research that the person buying those products was actually their adult children. And very different mindset when, from a pricing strategy. In the kid's mind, it was like, this is my mom and dad that, that need this product. I want the best for them. So in their eyes, money was no, no object. Um, whereas the, if you were marketing to the actual elderly person, regardless of their income, they could be very well off. They tended to be more frugal in their mindset. And, they feel like, well, I can't buy that, it's too expensive kind of thing. So again, consumer versus user is sometimes very different. You have to think about that with your product and how you're actually going to market your product. Um, but I'm glad you touched on that B2B, business to business versus business to consumer. And nowadays, um, with how products are being marketed and where you can sell them, there's so much online selling. Now, the overhead is very different if you're selling direct to consumer, but you also have to think about your shipping costs and, and some of the labor involved in some of that as well. So different things to keep in mind as you um, develop your product and your idea. 
So customer segmentation, what is that really? It's really nothing more than taking this big population of people and figuring out how to really put them in various buckets. How do you identify different characteristics of your audience? And again, as Mr. Stone touched on, it's like he was stealing my thunder here. <laughs> but it, you've obviously talked about this a little bit this week already in that um, you really have to focus in. And it's not that your product or your idea might not have more than one customer segment. It could have two, three, or four. But the, the big thing early on is to think about focusing in on your very first customer. Who is going to be the most likely target? And um, it'll help you develop that pricing strategy, a more focused uh, promotion, promotional strategy, might identify actually where you intend to sell the product. And that doesn't mean, uh, I don't think you're going to get into it in this particular plan, but oftentimes if you had to go to the bank to fund your business, you may have to have a longer range plan about how you tend, intend to launch your product and then think about future years. How are you going to grow that? Year one, and forecasting may touch on this in, in this particular class, year one volumes might be much smaller because you are more targeted and you're taking a smaller approach um, with regards to who you're focusing on. Years two and three, you can then more fully develop your marketing plan, your strategy. You can hit that second and third uh, customer segment or group. So that's important to think about that in the early phases of your business. Um, it's not that you want to forget about these other guys, but you don't have to be all inclusive. You can't be everything to everybody. Otherwise, you're going to yield very little because you're kind of watering down your marketing approach. Um, you're spending money broadly. And we always call it, you're not going to get much bang for the buck. And this is why thinking about a very focused approach makes makes a ton of sense. It'll also help you as you start thinking about your um, your competitive set as well, because your your competition for this particular audience might be different than a different targeted segment. So, um, but again, keep all of this in mind as you develop and and flesh out your. Mm -hmm. Your idea. So I wanted to show you the product adoption curve, and it sounds like you might have touched on this a little bit this week, but this is a, I love this because it's a, an easy visual, and to me this always ties right back to some of the future discussion when we talk about market size. Um, think about where your product fits in the market. A couple of you had some ideas on things that maybe have never been done before. That's going to be new innovation, and oftentimes you're going to end up in that new innovation section. You got the early adopters out in the blue out here. So think about that with your targeted scope and your market size. It's going to be it's going to look very different. Um, because it is so new. A lot of times you have to factor in the educational process. Like, how am I going to teach people about what this is? It has to be easy to explain. Um, one of the terms that I used to work with someone, she was a, an industrial designer. And she was hired for, at Venus, and I worked with her years ago, and she drove me crazy because she really wasn't a marketing person. But she had this knack of always asking why. Well, why is that? Why is that? She sounded like a five-year-old that drove me crazy. But when all was said and done, the more I had to explain the why, the more logical it was. And eventually, if I couldn't explain it all that well, to me it kind of meant that, well, maybe this wasn't real clear or concise. So keep asking yourself the question why. Um, I, last year I used this visual, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Kool-Aid anymore. Back when I was growing up, it was Hey Kool-Aid, and uh, the comp when I used to work for Rockline, we were, one of the terms we used is we wanted to be careful that we weren't drinking our own Kool-Aid. And what that means is sometimes you can be so convinced of yourself that you've got the best idea, you know, this is the next best thing since sliced bread. 
But if you have to start explaining it to somebody else and you can't answer those questions why, that's going to start to challenge your thinking. So be careful not to drink your own Kool-Aid. Um, never been done before is really, really difficult. More often, um, and every time I thought I had a brilliant idea that was brand new, sure as peanut butter, shortly thereafter I start doing a little research and I find out that, oh yeah, that's been done before. Now the thing is, you might have a concept that's um, similar to something that exists, but it has a little bit of a new twist to it. So that's important to identify on what is that feature, what is that benefit of your product, your idea. What is that differentiator? Differentiators are very important. So as you continue to work on your value proposition, think about why is my idea different? Why is my product different than anything else that might be out there already? And especially if you haven't kind of solidified your idea, maybe spend a little bit of time with Google and do a little research and find out if you can find something out there that really does exist. I can't tell you, I've, I've moved around in industry a little bit, and so often you can learn about a lot of things through the competition. That might tell you how to firm up your differentiator in some instances, but this is where you know doing a little bit of homework and research on your idea makes sense early on. The third category that I put on here is that, yeah, there might be uh, products that are out there in some market space already, but the market itself might be relatively new. Um, so think about some newer products and maybe newer segments of business that are still very much in a growth mode. Your idea, although it might not be all that different, if you're in a market where it's still relatively new, it's still an opportune time to jump in and gain some market share and, and capture some of that space. Um, when I was thinking about this a few weeks back, drones were one that came to mind. And one of the things that you see a lot more of supporting the real estate business today is people doing aerial views. I had a niece that got married over the Labor Day weekend and she had a, a small video that was done and it was all with drone technology. So it's still fairly new in our market. So that's maybe an example of a, a product or a service that is still fairly young that you may be able to capture some market share. Again, having that differentiator though can allow you to gain a foothold in there as well. So think about that. Um, just this week I was reading an article in the food industry about a guy that um, had an idea that is developing the idea on how to make robotics much easier to implement. We recently had a trade show for food industry and you saw a lot of robots in um, some of the back kitchens. You saw robots that were literally greeting people and taking them to their tables. You had robots that were taking um, food from the kitchen and bringing it out to the service desk for pickup. Um, but robots are very expensive and for a lot of restaurant owners, one of their big issues, why they had such a hard time buying into the concept, was because a lot of times robots require programming. Well, that's a very unique skill set that takes some skill level and some training. So he invented a robot that was much easier, or he's in the process of inventing and fleshing this out. He was actually looking for investors. Um, developing a robot that could be um, programmed via language that would make it very easy for the restaurant owner to talk through the steps of what the robot needs to do versus literally having to program it. And when you think about labor shortages that we have today and how labor costs are such a big part of um, products and services, that to me was like, that's, that's clearly some innovation there. It was taking an existing thing, but now a differentiator on that thing. Okay, so 
when we get into segmentation and, and now drilling down to this lowest level about your customer and, and think about um, common characteristics. First of all, you're thinking about demographics. So literally, just some of the factual side of things. You know, are male, female, gender neutral, who's your target, age categories, that can make a huge difference, especially when you're trying to figure out how to market your product, who you're marketing to, geographic region. Think about your product. There are some products that you might not be um, selling nationwide, as an example, snowmobiles. You're not going to find a snowmobile dealer south of probably Tennessee. Um, in fact, that's probably too far south already. But think about your product and who's going to be buying it. Where are they living? It all feeds into your business plan and your launch plan and, and how you're going to go to market and how you're going to estimate transportation costs and shipping costs and that type of thing. There are some businesses that are very appropriate to be very regional and local. And those gen tend to be um, service-related type products. So think about that. And um, other things are those psychographic or behavioral things. And what we mean by that is you, you're starting to identify um, what gets people excited. A lot of times you think about what, are, what do they do for fun? What are their pastimes like? What are their lives like? Are they married with children versus having lots of hobbies? Or you know, there's uh, the outdoor enthusiast. So all of those things will matter as you're thinking about who your target customer is. Yours is going to be very specific. You have the, the people who are very interested in cars and, and engines and, and stuff like that. That would be my son. He'd be a great target audience. For you but that's that would have absolutely zero appeal to me but that's what um, that's what makes business a lot of fun is you're not trying to be everything to everybody and you focus in on your market and your key segment and the more you understand about them the easier it's going to become to think about how to sell to them so the next few slides I think are going to go through some examples and who do you think this uh, demographic is targeting in this ad? Can you give me maybe an age category? Yeah. Mm. Age? No, age. Well, who do you think they're targeting here? Students. Yep, yep. That was pretty key in there. Um, what do you? So um, they're they're being very specific when they literally on their ad are talking about a student discount. So, yeah. I mean, probably women, because I've never shopped at H&M. Neither have I. I think they do have um, clothing for guys yeah. too, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it, it does tend to be the younger audience. So if you wanted to guesstimate at an age range, who do you think shops there? I would think like 13 to 20 years of age. That's maybe a, a good target market. Um, I probably would not be shopping for myself at H&M, so that's a good example. Um, the, the clue here is also offering a discount to those students. So again, very targeted market. If you think about the person that's buying for this category, that buyer is probably a much younger buyer. He or she is going to be thinking about who their target audience is. And you, the only types of clothes that you're going to find are going to be the, the younger, trendier types of clothes. Um, and, and how they manage that business tends to be very high turn. So there's constantly trend changes. So that type of a market is going to be very different than a stable product um, that doesn't change very often. Typical product life cycles, um, depending on the product category that you're in. I was totally shocked when I went to work for Valrap to find out that their product life cycle is well over 10 years. 
And when my daughter and I were touring a naval station um, at Pearl Harbor, one of the things I noticed on the ship were in their, in their galley kitchen were some Volrath products. And I mean, they've been around forever. Uh, when I was looking for some prints of a specific product, I found a print from 1954. Believe it or not, that was before I was born and I couldn't believe the product still existed. So product turnover in some industries is very, very long life cycle. Whereas anything that's fashion or clothing related, you're talking less than a year. Um, other products, product life cycles might be three to five years, one to two years if you're talking electronics. Um, just think about, you know, every year Apple comes out with a new iPhone and I've got a 13 and the day before they launched, the Apple 14, the iPhone 14, I was getting pinged by a company that rebuys and sells used electronics. And it was like, hurry up and sell your product so that you'll get the most money for it. And I'm like, why would I even think about upgrading my phone when there's so little that's different? And yet market research that was done within days and, and we're talking, this has all been in the last, what, two weeks. Market research that was done said um, it was like 37% of the population said they would go into debt to purchase the latest and greatest equipment. I was shocked by that number. But um, those are just, I guess this is the type of thing that a marketing and product management junkie just kind of gets into. The, that is the one thing I will tell you, is as you think about product and product development specifically, um, since I've been in marketing, I feel like everything I look at and every time I walk into a store, I'm thinking about things very differently because I'm not just the consumer. I'm also the person that understands some of the science behind why they do things the way they do it and what they might be trying to target. All right, so what about McDonald's? How do you think they're segmenting geographically? There is a video clip that's, that's linked here. Uh, but just this image here, where do you think these products are being sold? Have you ever walked into your local McDonald's and, and seen this on the food menu? Not here, Not here no. Um, so we're going to take a few minutes just to watch this video clip. So McDonald's, 118 countries and about 36,000 locations. I was blown away by that. And uh, now, when I looked at some of those countries, like literally, I had never heard of some of these. But then in fine print, I was looking at some of the detail behind it, and they're actually territories of France, as an example. They include a lot of these little islands that might be off the coast, but they categorize them as a, a country. But I found it very interesting, and my daughter loves to travel. I was just in Italy with her not that long ago. Uh, McDonald's is probably the last restaurant that I'm going to want to visit <laughs> if I'm traveling internationally, but one of her friends, when they went to France, insisted that they had to go to a McDonald's because her friend was very much into it. But yes, um, notice the same thing, you know, the menu is very different, the, the, uh, the items, the sizes, um, again, they're marketing specifically to their, their target audience. Um, I've heard of instances where I think this was, it might have been Coca-Cola. You have to think about name translations and interpretation when you go to other countries. And what might resonate with U.S. consumers, consumers 
Some of they have limited time menus as well, um, and that might be very uh, geographically related. You know, things that appeal to Southerners and East Coast. East Coast people eat something called grits. I have never heard of. I don't have you ever. Any of you ever tried grits or heard of them? Uh, it it sounded to. Oh no, Scrabble. That's the one. Not grits. Grits is more Southern. Scrabble is East Coast. And it sounded to me like it was everything that might have been on the grill or in the pan in the kitchen just kind of thrown together for going back to school. Before you submit your essays, welcome to, welcome to School of Wi Fi. Oh, <laughs> okay. Did it finally, yeah. It's, it looks like it's finally starting to spin. Okay. Yeah. But of course, very, 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 very slowly. Okay. There's, you tend to see a lot of barbecue and ribs in particular, um, Midwest, kind of in the Southeast, and there's, there's different regions even have different types of barbecue. North Carolina, for example, very different from Tennessee, very different from Kansas City. And I've only discovered that through some of my travels and, and business. Kansas City, in my opinion, has got awesome barbecue. Uh, but it, North Carolina tends to be more of the vinegar style barbecue and well that's actually the sauce but I think that's a very good point you might only find it in certain regions for some reason I keep thinking I know that Californians would be all that that into it again think about this psychographic and demographic that we're talking about here California seems to you know and people who live in California seem to be diff very different than than Midwest so yeah, I think if you, if you worked at McDonald's corporate and, and you were part of their marketing team, you might find that they're very strategic in their approach, and it's not going to be a nationwide necessarily. Obviously, Muslim countries are not serving it. But um, I also can tell you, I can also tell you part of the reason why they do it in a limited run is because the price of pork is more than, more than beef typically, okay. and so they wait till pork prices drop, and then all of a sudden they release the McRib and then the pork. Yep. Prices start to go back up, then it goes away. So yeah. those guys. <laughs> I yeah, well, and this is the skepticism what, from a marketing perspective. Um, one of the things that we've been experiencing in the last year and a half that's a really big deal, but it definitely influenced promotional opportunities was the supply chain issues. Literally, sometimes you needed to be planning for what what's going to be available to make. And that's what you're limited to being able to promote. But it could also very well be tied to pricing with the raw materials at a specific time um, as well. So all things that come into play as you develop marketing strategies. So what is the, who is the psychographic here, the segmentation that we're targeting in this particular email or uh, info, um, info piece? What are some of the things that kind of jump out at you? Um, Proprietary. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Those that are environmentally conscious, those that are worried about the environment, um, packaging, waste, sourcing responsibly. There's, you know, there's a thing called total cost, and there are a lot of consumers that are concerned about greenhouse gas emissions. And um, when I was at Rockline Industries, they actually put out an annual report that talks about their whole sustainability initiative. And it's not just, a, and we literally did map this out when I worked for them. We looked at what was the total cost and the total environmental impact 
of a baby wipe. Big, um, baby wipes are one of their big volume products. And when you think about the user, young moms wiping the butts of the baby off the baby, and it's you know those are disposable items. Um, what's the total impact on our world? It depends upon the, the types of fibers that, that are in those materials, the chemicals that go into them. So your product is focused on um, not using um, uh, chemicals that are harmful to the environment. There's the uh, cost of energy to make those raw materials, and a lot of those raw materials are made in the United States. Um, some as close as Appleton, Wisconsin, others as um, the, North, the uh, North Carolina region is a hot spot for a lot of manufacturing. There are other manufacturers that are down south, but thinking about the transportation of those raw materials, there are literally ways to calculate the total greenhouse gas emission on a package of product. And um, there are customers, Walmart, who, who is a big customer of Rockline, and they sell a ton of private label wipes. They're called Parents' Choice. Um, they were very interested in understanding the total greenhouse gas emissions. Now, our market research showed that parents, it, it kind of went in streaks. Parents are willing to pay more for a product if it's better for the environment within reason. Some of the more recent research, as we live in these inflationary times, you start to see that trade-off happening again because they have less dollars to be purchasing some of those things. Um, but there definitely is a huge demographic market of people that are interested in um, treating our, our environment and our, uh, our world differently. Um, when my daughter and I were in Germany a few years ago, there were a lot of protests going on because of consumers that were upset with their government because they felt they weren't doing enough for the environment. You hear a lot of that going on in the US right now as well. And when you look at the impact, um, those are very real things. The next example here, um, gift cards. The targeted audience is who? And what type of um, behavior does this segment maybe represent? What are some examples of when this is, when you might be thinking about use of these? Mm -hmm. uh, Christmas and birthdays, mm -hmm. birthdays are generally What type of consumer um, or user might be a good user of these types of products? You can see that clearly by some of the images that they use on these specific gift cards. Um, when I look at the audience that I'm talking to today, I remember when my kids were about your age, that was like the perfect target audience because they're living in a very fast-paced, changing world. It was very hard to understand what they might be interested in. So gas cards, food cards, gift cards for specific stores that they might be interested in shopping in were always perfect and are still very popular for younger couples getting married. Um, and it's because sometimes it's very hard to understand what's appealing to that specific individual. So we'll take the easy way out and we'll just buy a gift card and allow them to purchase whatever they want. But again, how they market a lot of those gift cards. Where do you find um, some of these gift cards? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes for retailers that, I've noticed there are some retailers that aren't even in our local region. But again, think about the consumer, the customer, and who they might be buying for. Um, it could be a college student that you're sending them a care package and you know that they've got an olive garden in their particular city, so you buy them the olive garden or the garden gift card that they can use um, when they're at school. So it's, it's perfect in that instance. 
So we only have, I think, about eight or nine minutes left. We're going to talk a little bit about um, Starbucks and kind of maybe do this as a little bit more of an interactive. Um, do they have the worksheet for? Okay. It's in there. Okay. Class pages. Um, so I don't know if you've got that information available. But let's talk a little bit about Starbucks and some of their potential target markets. Who do you think they are? They might be targeting some of their products. First of all. Can you tell me what kind of product categories do they have? Uh, coffee and food, mm -hmm. and other food drinks. Some of their latest ventures, and this has probably been several years now already, are some of the things beyond coffee and some of their mixed fruity type uh, drinks that, that might be targeted for people who are drinking when? Not necessarily in the morning. I'm sorry, you had something you were going to add? Mm -hmm. Kind of more into that idea. Yeah. I don't know too much about Starbucks. Um, I've been there literally only one time mm -hmm. where I ordered something, and I got tea, so they have tea. That's all I'm say. Okay. Um, so who do you think they're targeting, though? Think about their demographics. So they age categories. Probably a younger, Probably a younger audience, like... Teenagers to like young adults. Mm -hmm. um, what type of income do you think they might have? Um, in my opinion, I think that depends. I know some people might just get Starbucks because it's trendy, regardless of income. Um, but I'd say usually. There could also be, actually, I think it might go a little bit beyond that. Um, one of the target consumers, and you see this a lot in larger cities, where you'll see a Starbucks within a building. There are, and there's a lot of Starbucks within a retailer as well. Um, in larger cities, and some of my travels, one of the things that I've seen is that there tends to be this younger, um, seems like everybody's younger than me, but the younger business person um, that always seems to have that Starbucks cup in their hand. And now I've got a daughter who's at that age, and she still would much prefer her Starbucks coffee. And yet a consumer like myself, I'm like, well, I'll tend to stick to the more traditional, just I'll just have a coffee. And their coffee is just, in my opinion, not that great. I think Dunkin' Donuts has better coffee. Um, but then when you think about a lot of their drinks, what do they specialize in? It's not really like sugary and fatty and unhealthy drinks. Um, yeah. They don't have to be, but in many instances you'll find that it's customization. And it's the customer experience. Um, you know, you order your special coffee or latte with a specific type of milk in it, and there's the soy milk, the almond milk, the coconut milk, the oat milk. Um, everything but milk these days is they're putting into these drinks. Um, so there are, there can be healthier options, um, but then, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about some of the um, fruitier drinks or some of the mixers, and it's the people who maybe aren't the coffee drinkers but still want to go there. They've tended to attract um, a lot of those younger business professionals, some that maybe were working independently, and they were one of the first to offer you know, free Wi-Fi and sit and have a cup of coffee and do your work while you were sitting in the Starbucks, and that might have been your only interaction if you were an independent small company working on your own. So it was more about the environment and the atmosphere. So can you think about the last time you saw a Starbucks commercial? Do any of you ever remember seeing a Starbucks commercial? No. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So thinking about their audience again, and all tells you a little bit more about where they're going to 
target their marketing Please and, and target your organization. Um, just a reminder that all fiscal education aides have a meeting in room 116 at one, I'm sorry, 1115. <coughs> okay, I think we're a wrap for today. Um, next week we're going to talk a little bit more about customer personas and we'll probably do some in-class work on that. So think about some of these things over your weekend. This was very high level, customer, market, targets, and um, look forward to spending more time with you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.